Thank you and welcome to our Discover Macomb event, highlighting our engineering and advanced technology. I'd like to talk to you a little bit tonight about the agenda. We're gonna talk a, a little bit about why to choose Macomb. We're gonna do an overview of our engineering and advanced technology programs. We've got a great video for you to watch and uh, you're gonna be talking directly uh, with um, the people who are handling our engineering and advanced technology programs. We're gonna have a question and answer period at the end. So if you have any questions, please feel free to use uh, the chat. We will be watching the chat throughout the presentation. And at the very end, we'll be going over those um, questions and uh, we will have um, our team members uh, answering those questions for you. And then we'll have a wrap up and um, our next steps. Uh, my name is Terry Pagano and I am the admissions and outreach coordinator. And I just wanna give you a brief information about Macomb before we pass this over. Macomb has over 200 programs. You can see there are several uh, locations. And the reason that we have several locations is because our labs are very large. You're getting very hands-on learning, as you can see from the pictures below. So we have to have very large labs to be able to teach the students. So you can see the programs that are offered at our Warren campus, including um, our engineering and technology area and skilled trades. Our center campus is located at Clinton Township. We also have any general education programs that you're gonna be taking, you can take at either campus, south or center. And our east campus um, houses our police and fire. And MTAC is specifically for employers to send their employees for further training. We like students to kind of think about a pathway. So if you're interested in engineering and technology, we have a lot of programs involved, which you're going to learn about tonight. Sometimes students change their mind. Um, it just makes it easier for us to kind of get an idea of what you want to study. So you're going to be talking to our Macomb counselors um, regarding your pathway. We have a lot of upcoming events that you can see. and. Also, uh, we have a registration link on the bottom that you can go to and look for um, any of these events that might help you in the process of applying or getting through the funnel. Um, there's also a QR code there that you can uh, take a picture of, and um, you can also just go right to our website and sign up for any of these upcoming admission um, events. So again, um, we're going to be watching a short video uh, regarding engineering and advanced technology. So sit back and relax and watch the video. ventilation and cooling systems, HVAC for short, keep our homes and workplaces comfortable year-round. That is, until they no longer work. Macomb's Climate Control Technology Program prepares you for a high-demand career, installing, maintaining, and repairing both residential and commercial HVAC and refrigeration systems. You'll learn the most up-to-date technology used in climate control and gain the skills you need to service older systems still in use. And best of all, classes are structured around your busy schedule so you can learn the skills you need when it's convenient for you. Just as smartphones have revolutionized the way we look at the world, smart technology is reinventing the way we live within it. If being in a high-tech, high-demand growing field interests you, then Macomb Community College's Building Performance and Energy Management Program is for you. One of the few programs of its kind in Michigan, BPEM combines elements of energy management, climate control, and information technology, training you to optimize energy efficiency for residential, commercial, and industrial buildings. You'll learn how to create a smart ecosystem for new buildings and how to retrofit older structures with the technology to control temperature, humidity, lighting, and security in an environmentally sound and economically efficient way. Get in on the ground floor of this exciting field. It's a smart choice for a smart future. 
Every day we live in and around our built environment, so why not learn how to design it in architecture, build it in construction management, and learn about materials and testing in civil technology. Sketch drawings to design and create 3D digital models. Learn how the structures around us are built and get hands-on experience testing materials and using equipment. Work with real clients, architects, contractors, engineers, and open the job opportunities for you. These programs offer credentials, complete transfer to universities, and even articulated free classes from local high schools. So come have fun creating your world and the world around us. Visit any time to see for yourself how amazing these professions can be for you. What do you want from a career? Do you want excitement? Do you want to work with the newest technology in a high demand field? Then the CNC program at Macomb Community College could be the place for you. CNC stands for Computer Numeric Control. They are used to semi-automate or automate the production of advanced manufacturing. CNC machines manufacture just about anything you can think of, from guitars to cars to cell phones. If something is being made today, it's most likely being machined on a CNC machine. I think kind of what sets us apart from the competition would be the state-of-the-art machinery we have. We're lucky enough to have funding so that we can continue to buy new machines. We just have a variety of technology from CNC machines all the way through five axes, electrical discharge machines, coordinate measuring machines, lasers, rapid prototyping, and it goes on and on and on. So we're pretty fortunate with that. If I didn't go to Macomb and complete my apprenticeship, I wouldn't have the opportunities that I do here in the engineering department. The classes that I took at Macomb were very helpful. They were directly related to my work that I did on an everyday basis, and that gave me the knowledge to be where I am today. I didn't want my education to be a reason that I didn't get a career, so I made sure that I took full advantage of every class, the teachers and everything they offered, and I'm very grateful for what Macomb Community College did for me. I work with many employers to customize the certificate for the related instruction piece of the apprenticeship. And that certificate can then go toward an associate's degree. We also have, for those students that don't already have an employer lined up but they want to learn a trade, uh, we have 20 different general certificate programs in the skilled trades, ranging from as low as 17 credits to as much as I think our largest one is 44 credits. So students can learn trades in um, basic or advanced welding, tool and die, CNC machinists, computer aided manufacturing. All of those certificates are available and set up based on what we know about the local industry and what we know those needs are. So even if they haven't gone through a customized employer certificate, they're getting a skill set that will work with the local industry. And then the local industry can pick that student up and um, further tailor that from there if they wanted them to get additional classes or to improve on those skill sets anymore. Um, so either way, Macomb Community College, we've been involved in apprenticeship for more than 60 years. Um, Really, it started you know, where we are in so many manufacturing plants from the big three in this area. They've always been very heavy into apprenticeship, and so there was an immediate need in this area for an educational institution to provide that related instruction component. All right, what I'd like to do now is uh, pass this over to Vicki Gordon, who you saw on the short video there. Uh, she's the apprentice coordinator. Vicki, welcome. Thanks, Terry, and good evening, everybody. Thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, so you heard me talk a little bit about apprenticeship there in that video. I'll uh, circle back to that. Uh, we're not quite at the questions point uh, uh, quite yet. Um, so uh, I'm gonna give you some, an overview of some of our programs at Macomb. And then I'm going to invite my partner, Tim Pulowski, in to talk about a few other things. So this is a, a brief overview of the programs that we offer within the Engineering and Advanced Technology Department. Uh, so you can see we have quite a wide range of programs, uh, CNC machinists, mechatronics technician, maintenance mechanics, millwrights, automotive, uh, you name it, we've got it. 
So uh, lots of different program areas to explore. All of these programs have a certificate option as well as a degree option. So if you, you know, just wanted to come and get a certificate for now and then come back and do an associate's degree later, that's an option for you. Um, or, you know, if you want to um, hit them both right out of the gate, that's an option for you as well. So we have a lot of different offerings um, and we're very excited to share some of this with you this evening. So about the associate's degree. So particularly in our skilled trades area, all of our certificates are um, stackable. So you can do multiple certificates, about usually two is, is the max that'll fit into the 62 credits for the associate's degree. Stack on the general education, which we call the arts and sciences requirements. Um, and then if you do need any elective courses, you can build those in to go towards your associate's degree. So for example, you might decide that you wanted to do the CNC machinist certificate and you saw an overview of that program in the video and how exciting that is. Um, so you could take that certificate and then to get some uh, additional skill sets, maybe you, know, you dabbled a little bit in welding and are interested in that. You could stack in that basic welding certificate. So you've kind of got that two tiered skill set going on. Do your 15 credits of general education, which is um, there's four groups in general education, just to give you a, just a brief overview. And general education is, is not our area, but it is part of the curriculum in order to you know, turn your, your um, education into an associate's degree. So it would be the English, there's an English class, a math or science class is the second group. The third group is social science. And the fourth group is humanities or health education. So you add those classes in. Um, if you're still below the 62 credits, which is what's required for the Associate of Applied Science degree, you could build in some related electives. So perhaps you could take some more advanced welding courses that weren't part of the basic certificate. Or perhaps you want to dabble a little bit and take maybe a, um, an introductory course in the HVAC area just to round out you know, maybe you're, you know, interested in, in learning a little bit more of that, about that system. Um, you could build that in as elective. Uh, and then once you get to that 62, you qualify for the Associate of Applied Science. And then the Associate of Applied Science um, is either manufacturing technology, maintenance technology, or building construction technology. And which one you go for depends upon the certificates that you got. So if you did the two that I mentioned, those are manufacturing related certificates that would go toward our manufacturing technology degree. Let's say that you did like a maintenance mechanic certificate and a mill rate certificate, for example. Those would be more of the maintenance trades. And in building construction technology, perhaps a carpenter or even um, a plumbing certificate, those could go toward building construction technology. So that's how the associate's degrees work within the applied technology area. And then EAT, Engineering and Advanced Technology, has several other, um, you know, certificate and degree programs as well in different areas. Um, but Tim and I are mainly going to be talking to you tonight about the skilled trades that I just covered. So apprenticeship, we typically get a lot of questions about apprenticeship at these events, as well as, you know, just phone calls and students walking in asking about apprenticeship. Uh, we're fortunate in the geographic area that we're in. Macomb Community College has been around and been doing related instruction for apprenticeship for over 60 years. Uh, you know, we're right smack dab in the middle of the manufacturing hub of the United States and um, employers in the area that had apprenticeship programs needed an institution to go to to be able to fulfill the related instruction component of the apprenticeship. And Macomb Community College stepped in and that's how the applied technology department at Macomb Community College was born. So for those of you that aren't familiar with the apprenticeship model, it is a combination of on-the-job training or what they now are calling on-the-job learning. So there's on-the-job learning hours. And then the other part of it is what they call the related technical instruction. Those are the school hours. So that's where Macomb comes in. Uh, the traditional registered apprenticeship model, when you think of skilled trades, the traditional trades like um, machining and welding, um, millwright, electrician, those are typically four-year apprenticeship programs. And so at that term, at a four-year term, the on-the-job training piece is 8,000 hours, and that's paced out over 2,000 hours per year of the four-year term. And then the related instruction piece is a minimum of 576 contact hours, which is roughly around 36 credits, um, and that needs to be paced out over 144 minimum contact hour per year. So the apprentice is, um, you know, it's a job. You get hired by the employer that has the apprenticeship. Um, you're placed under the um, tutelage of what we would call a master tradesman or a master craftsman in that area. 
um, and you learn the on the job, the work processes, the on the job learning, you learn from that person. Um, and then simultaneously after work, and some employers allow um, their apprentices to go to school during work hours, but it's much more common that you would work during the day for the employer learning on the job and then augment with those school hours at night, a couple of nights a week after, after work. Um, apprenticeship is really, really growing. Um, we've increased 70% since 2011. That's across the country. Um, so that's 1.9 million new apprentices and 38% more active apprentices than the previous 10 year average. Uh, like I said, we've been involved in this for 60 years and you heard me talk in the video. We work very, very closely with local employers to tune those skill sets in. So not only do Tim and I, I'm gonna introduce Tim in a few minutes, we work with local employers to design that related instruction certificate specifically to meet the needs of their apprenticeship. We also have those programs that I was talking about earlier, those baseline certificate programs. So you can come in and learn CNC machinist, millwright. And those are the programs that the employer credentials are based on. So you're getting a very, um, you know, similar skill set. We just are here to work with the employers to fine tune that a little bit more for their registered apprentices. So with that being said, we do have quite a few employers that are coming to the college now. Um, you know, a traditionally registered apprenticeship or apprenticeship was for, you know, employers that would have, you know, some people already working on the job that they wanted to indenture as apprentices and then upskill and train into craftsmen. More and more common now, employers aren't, don't have that, that workforce already in place. So a lot of employers now are coming to the college asking about, you know, can we hire, um, hire some students to put into the apprentice, our apprenticeship program? How does that work? Uh, so what we do with the employers now that come in asking for that, we don't place students into apprenticeship programs. We're here to work with employers to design the related instruction. But what we do for those employers that are looking for candidates is we have them post with our career services department. And that's another area of the college that you'll probably learn about in a future seminar, or if you um, become a student at Macomb, that's a service that you'll learn about. But that department runs an online jobs database. And so we um, have employers post those apprenticeship opportunities on there. And then our students that aren't already uh, working for an employer in an apprenticeship that want that kind of an opportunity can go ahead and apply for those through the Macomb Career Link. And we've had a lot of students to get apprenticeship opportunities through that system. Another good way to prepare yourself for an apprenticeship program, if this is something that you're interested in, we have what's called the Industrial Readiness Certificate Program. Some of you may have heard of this. It was, uh, we had a grant funded program that was paying for that for several years. It just ended last summer. That was the MAP Plus program. Uh, we still have that certificate that we offered under MAP Plus. We just don't have, uh, we don't currently have grant funding to pay for it, but it is a very affordable certificate. It's a small credential that we worked with local employers to develop back in 2013. And that was when we first started seeing a lot of employers coming, coming into the college saying, hey, you know, we need some people to put into these programs. We don't have the incumbent workforce. So we really want to learn, you know, we really want to um, start looking to the college for this. Um, do you have kind of this, you know, foundational program that would show to us that if a student completed this credential, it shows that they have the aptitude to undertake the rigors of such a, you know, an apprenticeship program. So the industrial readiness certificate is for foundational courses. Now they're not um, the super, what I would, what we would call the super flashy courses with some of the technology that you saw on the screen, but they're basics in terms of uh, applied mathematics. There's one course in applied math. There's a course in blueprint reading. There's a course in industrial safety. And then there's a capstone course called trade related preparation. Those four courses together are nine credit hours and 144 contact hours. And that is a credential that a lot of employers are recruiting out of right now. Uh, so if you, you know, declare yourself on that certificate at the college and complete those courses, a lot of employers will work with our career services staff to pull students that have been um, through or close to completing that program. And those classes we offer every semester. We offer them uh, typically both online and on, on, on ground. So there's a lot of options to fit everybody's schedule. Uh, I did see one question pop up in the chat. What is the role of the apprentice? And I know we were going to do questions at the end, but since it kind of ties into what I'm talking about here, I'll go ahead and address that now. 
So an apprentice is somebody, um, you know, if you have, let's take a tool and die shop for an example, they typically have a crew of, you know, a small, depending on the, the size of the shop, a crew of machinists or CNC machinists that are working in that shop. What we're seeing locally now, um, and this is true of the country too, but obviously as a community college, we're involved in the community. So what we're seeing is a lot of these shops that have, um, you know, workforces that that crew of CNC machinists is they're starting to get into retirement age, you know, they could retire at any time. And these employers haven't had a crew of people coming up behind them. So the role of the apprentice is to learn in that trade under that master so that they can eventually one day, you know, get up to that level of you working at that master craftsman level, whether they just join that master craftsman at that level, or they take their place once they retire. And so the, the time-based system of registered apprenticeship really allows the apprentice to, to really hone in on those skills under the master craftsman and really learn all of that stuff at a very detailed level. And then again, augmenting with the related instruction piece through the college. Um, and our programs, we do very well at Macomb with the related instruction um, and the apprenticeship programs. And as you heard our CNC machinist instructor talk about in the video, we're very fortunate to have a lot of really great equipment, a lot of really uh, great faculty, um, great facilities going on. Um, so we're, we're, we're in a really good position and we are benchmarked by a lot of institutions across the country for the work that we do in apprenticeship. Okay, I would like to introduce my partner, Tim Palowski. He is also an apprentice coordinator. Um, he just joined me in this role in December. So I'm very excited to have him on board with me. Um, so we're now kind of functioning as the dynamic duo. Take it away, Tim. All right, thanks, Vicki. Hey, before I get into class formats and what we're actually doing, I wanna add on to uh, kind of what Vicki was talking about. If you're thinking about coming into trades, and this was really, for any trade for that matter. Um, the demand is extremely high when you're really looking at um, what local companies are looking for. We just had a company come through and they have um, right around 20 apprentices here that they just started. And they made a statement that by the time those 20 apprentices graduate, they're going to have over a hundred, um, what would be considered uh, master technicians retiring. Right. That's how far behind they are in the trend. And this and this really started um, almost a decade ago. Um, and it's really taken to this point for these companies to um, hate to use the word panic, but but really start to panic and, and so spend some serious time investing um, into workforce training and onboarding through apprenticeship or other various avenues. So for any new potential um, individual coming into the trades, there's opportunities for you to exponentially grow in these companies um, much faster than you would have, let's say, 20 years ago, if you were getting into the trades, right? You're going to be able to jump ladder rungs that would have taken you a career to get to, and you may be there in five years, six years even. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity. This really goes for all the trades. Some are a little bit have a little higher demand than others, um, but there isn't really a bad one to choose if you're thinking about going into that. So just so you're aware. All right. So uh, classes, as everybody knows with COVID, it's been a wild two years and we get this question quite often um, with new potential students coming in of how do we run these hands-on classes um, in this virtual type environment that everybody's uh, been been dealing with. So we are very much hands-on. Um, I'm not going to say all of our classes are hands-on, but as many as possible are hands-on, are in person. Um, and and we're going to make sure that we 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 meet those needs. So since um, what was it two years ago in winter when COVID um, kind of hit our world, there's a very short amount of time that all of our classes were virtual. And, and I'm talking about a half a semester, but within that half a semester, we were able to figure out how to operate safe, uh, social distance, um, reduce any type of contraction of the virus um, and get our welding classes, machining classes, CNC classes um, back on ground and, and functioning in a hands-on format. So from there, uh, we've gotten a lot better at this. 
but we have a combination of really four versions um, of, of courses. So we have our traditional on-ground classes. So let's say you were in a plumbing class, you'd sign up for a given day and time, you're gonna report to one of the three locations and I'll talk about that in a minute. And you'd sit in class, you'd receive a lecture or have some hands-on lab time and you'd go home just like you would in any traditional classroom. We have also a hybrid model and sometimes we'll team this up with our ex heavy extensive lab classes. So let's say welding for an example, you can only teach so much welding online. Um, so you have to eventually get in the classroom. So there are assigned day and times for those types of courses, but you're not gonna meet every day um, or every session on ground. So maybe there's virtual lectures or student directed homework that's done um, on even weeks or odd weeks or week three of, of 16 weeks, right? Um, hybrids are kind of um, the wild, wild west when it comes to the combinations. Every class is gonna be a little bit different as far as how much is online and how much is on ground. But the important thing to understand is that the, it is a combination of online instruction. Usually that's gonna be your lecture and quizzes, tests, um, uh, assignments like that and on ground. So you'd be, you'd be coming in and receiving that lab um, instruction. So uh, the next two uh, modalities are both virtual, right? They have no on ground um, portion of the course, but they are a little bit different. So we have what's called a remote course and remote still has an assigned day and time that you're gonna meet, but every session you're gonna meet virtually. So just like here, you're gonna have a teacher, they're gonna be delivering a lecture or having a online discussion that is um, in real time, they're gonna be interacting with you, can immediately answer questions. So just like you were in a classroom, but virtually. We're finding that we're using this type before, let's say a blueprint reading class or a math class, um, maybe, an English class, or in some cases, a higher level um, electronics class that maybe is a lot of, you know, your math and, and lecture base. It doesn't really have a whole lot of hands on, th more theory based courses. And then lastly, is a true online class. So, a true online class would be 100% um, online, no day and time. Uh, it's going to be a student driven, asynchronous course. So, that means uh, there's weekly assignments that come out on a Sunday or a Monday and you have given deadlines and it doesn't matter if you're doing it after work, eight o'clock in the morning, two o'clock in the morning, you can do it any time you want at any pace. Um, so that, that would be what we, what most of us know as a traditional online class. So we do have, have those, our IRCP program that Vicki had talked about. All of those classes are offered um, sometimes in a true virtual online format. Um, and then occasionally, you know, we'll have other versions. We don't offer too many of true virtual courses. Most of our classes are going to be um, probably the most is going to be on ground. And then hybrid and remote are probably an even split. So um, those are the those are the four types. So um, exciting. <clears throat> we are embarking on um, a massive renovation to our trades building. Um, so what would be considered our South Campus RS&T building, and that's where welding, machining, product development, our media and communication arts, I know we're not really talking about them, but they were in there, robotics, um, all of those programs are housed in that building. So we're, we just uh, embarked on a two-year renovation, um, which has caused us to move and create some temporary space for those programs. So um, all, the majority of those programs um, have moved over to our have moved over to our new building, which is on 15 and Little Mac, and um, that building uh, is going to hold all those those programs that we listed. Mainly, what was in that RST building. We have our M building, which is still on our South Campus, which is the campus that's pictured behind me. Um, so that's going to be at 12 Mile and Hayes, and um, that building. Um, that's going to house our automotive, our architecture, climate control, plumbing, 
is housed in there. We do a lot of our math and lecture-based courses out of there because you have a little bit more room with just classrooms. Um, so that's going to be our South Campus M building. And then lastly, we have our M Tech facility, and that is on Van Dyke, um, just north of 696, so between 11 and 12. And our welding has moved over to M Tech. So M Tech runs mainly our non credit programs. Um, but we did build a state-of-the-art temporary welding facility in that location so we can run our programs and get that hands-on portion for the time being. So, so yeah, so we have those three locations, um, and hopefully in two years' time, we'll all be back under the same roof uh, back at the RST building and uh, with a whole lot new digs. So, but, um, and on this slide, it has all of our contact information. Um, you've already met Vicki Gordon. She's an apprentice coordinator um, here at Macomb. All the way at the bottom is myself. So feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions. Some of our other faculty that teach in our um, trades areas, Doug Marlowe, he's not here tonight. He oversees climate control. Lisa Richter is our building performance and energy management. She also does our drafting and some of our math classes and Janice Grant oversees architecture, construction, and civil. So, all right. I also wanted to mention, and I forgot to mention in that video, when you saw um, there was an apprentice named Dave Rebecca that worked for Proper Tooling. Dave is a really good example of a traditional apprentice pathway. He started at Proper Tooling when he was a teenager sweeping floors. Um, and he was working there as an incumbent worker when they started realizing that they were really lacking in their succession planning for their workforce. A lot of their machinists were starting to reach, reach that retirement age. Um, and the company was starting to, like, like Tim used the word earlier, panic a little bit because they realized they didn't have anybody coming up behind these guys. Uh, so Dave was one of the incumbent workers that was tapped to go into the apprenticeship program. An apprenticeship has, you know, multiple pathways associated with it. So Dave went through a mold maker apprenticeship, which is a version of a CNC machinist apprenticeship. Um, and when he was done, you know, he could have stayed as a mold maker for, you know, as long as he wanted to. Uh, but for Dave, he took kind of a different pathway. He went into design and then eventually he, he worked as a mold maker after he finished his apprenticeship for several years. Then he took a pathway into design and then he's now he's working in more on the sales side. So there's a lot of different pathways available for apprentices and there's a lot of educational pathways available as well. I talked about the associate's degree, but it doesn't end there. We have a lot of transfer pathways with four-year institutions. So you can take the related instruction for your apprenticeship, um, stack it into that associate's degree, like I talked about earlier. And then that associate's degree, as well as usually about 25 to 30 credits and what we call bridge courses that can still be taken at the community college level, can then be transferred to one of our four-year partners for a bachelor's degree. Uh, for example, Ferris State University has a Bachelor of Applied Science and in Industrial Technology and Management, which is a really popular pathway. And then Wayne State has some really great engineering technology pathways and mechanical engineering, electrical engineering. They even now have a welding engineering technology. Um, so those engineering technology pathways are, uh, those bachelor's degrees are really popular pathways for our students as well. Um, so apprenticeship can be, you know, what you make of it. Um, and it, I also tell students that are looking for apprenticeship opportunities, um, not only do employers post in the Macomb career link, but if you are interested in a skilled trade and you'd like to get an apprenticeship, do that industrial readiness certificate that I talked about earlier. But also if you have an area that you know you're interested in, like you like welding, you know, you like CNC machining, um, you know, start taking classes in one of those areas, uh, maybe go toward one of those trade certificates. Um, that also shows employers that you have skin in the game, that you're interested in this trade and you're taking classes to learn more and make yourself more marketable. We have a lot of students that end up with apprenticeship opportunities that way, even from networking with, because the classes are a mixed population of both working apprentices and students that are looking for those opportunities. And then the faculty too, often have a lot of leads with companies. So we have a lot of students that end up learning about apprenticeship opportunities simply by networking with students in the classes that they're taking or with 
those faculty. So there's a lot of different, there's a lot of opportunities out there. And not only is there the Macomb Career Link to look for opportunities, the Department of Labor has an apprenticeship finder on their website where you can narrow it down by zip code and find employers that are hiring apprentices in your area. And the Michigan Works Talent Connect also has a skilled trades um, search option where you can look for employers that are looking for apprentices. Um, all employers don't necessarily need to use Macomb Community College for, late, for the related instruction piece of their apprenticeship. A lot of the ones in the area do, the great majority do, uh, but some may use other providers. So you may not end up at Macomb Community College depending on what opportunity you take advantage of. Uh, but hopefully, you know, some of the things we talked about tonight gave you a better understanding of what an apprentice is, what they do, um, and how those programs work at Macomb. Jump in real fast before we get to yeah. um, some more Q&As. The other thing that I hear a lot of questions from students about is cost of program. So uh, when you look at apprenticeship, traditionally, not always, but many times the employer is paying um, for those courses. So that's a huge benefit to the student, right? So that's a, a reduced cost that you have to worry about. Um, but even the the non-apprentices that are just going through trades programs, the market is getting so aggressive right now as far as onboarding and finding talent that it is very common that um, just employed students, so not formal apprentices, employed students are also getting their tuition paid for. So if you're actively working in the trades um, and you're, or, or maybe thinking about getting into that, right, that's something you can ask uh, at the time of interview or once you get in, or maybe something that you're looking for, that those opportunities are out there. It didn't used to be that way, you know, a decade ago, but it definitely is starting to become much more common now. If, let's say you're working at a company and you're very happy with them, um, but they are not going to pay for your education. And that's fine, too. Macomb also has a lot, a ton of scholarship opportunities. And commonly, um, you know, students in trades programs, when I talk to them, they say, well, hey, I wasn't an A student. I really wasn't even good at school. There's no way I'm going to get a scholarship. The majority of these scholarships uh, have nothing to do with your GPA as long as you're not like completely failing out of your classes, right? Um, but they're just, they want to know your story, right? These donors want to hear about you. They came from the trades or they had a company and they were invested in trades. So they want to hear your story. You have to write a short paragraph, kind of explain your situation and, uh, and you can be granted the money. And the money can stack from, from um, scholarship to scholarship. So you can apply for essentially every scholarship we have at Macomb that'll fit the area if you want. Um, sometimes money has to be spent within a year. Sometimes it can be spent across your whole program. Sometimes it can buy books and, and other um, needs for the class, sometimes not. Uh, but you can contact our Macomb Foundation office and they can help you out with that. But um, I've had a handful of students that as long as they're willing to do that little bit of leg work, um, they've been able to navigate through almost their whole pro program without paying anything or very little um, by, by just stacking those scholarship opportunities. And, and you, you'd be surprised for how many scholarship opportunities we have, how few students apply, right? Because they really think that, you know, there's going to be this robust number of students that are all going to be these honor roll candidates and there's no way they're going to get them. So the people just don't do the work. Um, so if you're willing to put the time in, uh, you can really capitalize that and and reduce the cost. And Macomb, you know, relative to other community colleges and four-year institutions, are really not that expensive. I don't want to quote dollar amounts because they change the uh, the pricing on us. We don't charge by credit hour anymore. We charge by contact hour. So I don't know that number as well. But it's relatively inexpensive. So when you look at these scholarships that are anywhere between six hundred and two grand, and if you can stack them from year to year, you can cover a lot of your tuition. Um, so I just want to make sure that I pointed that out. I see a question in the chat. If I can just go ahead and grab that one. Do the trades still have pension programs for employees? So that's going to depend on the employer. The, typically where we see the pensions is with the UAW employers, and that's typically the big three, right? So Chrysler, Ford, and General Motors, those are the types of apprenticeships that have the pensions attached to them. Um, the big three, they um, hire, 
they put people into their apprenticeship program strictly from their incumbent workforce. So you have to be already working for the company in order to get into the apprenticeship program with one of the big three. Um, and they have avenues for that once you're actually working there. There's a, a set of classes that you take and then you're put on a list to be considered for the apprenticeship program. So you would have to be already working there in production or, or, or some other kind of a, you know, a basic position in order to be considered for apprenticeship. And that's where we typically see those the pensions associated. There's other employers, too, that are UAW affiliated. And that brings me to another point that I forgot to mention. Um, a lot of people associate apprenticeship only with unions. Um, apprenticeships are both union and non-union. It just depends on the employer and whether or not their workforce is organized by a labor union. If the workforce is organized by a labor union, then that union has a hand in the apprenticeship program, the selection and the way the program is ran. Um, if not, then the union's not involved because it doesn't have a presence at that employer. So it just depends on the company. Oh, and what Tim was talking about cost, I wanted to just give a quick um, cost. So that industrial readiness certificate I was talking about, that would be roughly, that's nine credits times, what are we at right now? 204 per credit hour. So that's roughly 1800, just over $1,800 for that credential. I think we're ready to open it up to more questions if uh, anybody has more questions. And I think we have a couple people that are manning the chat for us. While we're waiting on some more questions, I can jump in here too. Mm -hmm. A lot of the trades too, um, unless you come from a trades family, um, many people aren't aware of the opportunities that are out there. Um, and trades have changed a lot over the years with advancements in technology. Now, some trades, uh, maybe not as much. Let's say if you were going to be in the construction end of the industry, uh, let's say a, a brick mason, right? Now, there's definitely been technology changes there, right? But at the end of the day, it's still a very hands-on, uh, physically active trade, right? But if we take a step and we look at a trade like climate control, um, there is a lot of different avenues that you can go with that. So um, let's say you were young and have energy and you want to travel and you want to be outside. I mean, you can travel all over the United States. You can be working indoor. You can be working outdoor. If you don't want to travel, you can work for a local company um, doing residential, commercial. Um, let's say you get a little bit older and or and you don't want to carry as many heavy tools. Um, you can get into the controls end of things. And those guys, they don't ever pick up a wrench or a tool in, in their life, right? Everything is behind a computer. They're looking at full systems of a building and um, and how that's operating kind of as a whole unit. So um, there's a lot of opportunities that you can go. Um, and, and some, you know, you, you wear, you know, you could wear a suit to work because you're not going to be touching much dirt at all. And others get ready to do laundry because you're going to be pretty dirty every single day that you come home. And that's fine, right? Whichever way you want to go. Um, but I think that uh, many, many new families to the trades, they don't quite understand um, the advancements, especially in health and safety, you know, let's take automotive, for example, right? The new, um, production lines, there is not any dirt or grease laying around. I mean, they are well lit. They are well painted. They're clean. Um, they're a safe environment. There's lots of training that's invested in employees to make sure that they're safe. Ergonomics is a big thing. Um, so you can do that for a lifetime and, and not end up, you know, with a sore back and things like that. So, um, I just want to point that out, that there is a lot of different avenues, depending on what you want to go. And the nice thing is, too, a lot many times when you commit to one trade, there's different pathways within that pocket that you can kind of shift as you age or evolve um, within that trade. Okay. Um, and feel free to add on to this. I did have a couple of questions in the chat here. So let me just... Uh... Um, go through. It says, how can I find an apprenticeship? So how to find an apprenticeship? There's a few different avenues. I mentioned the Macomb Career Link. That is the jobs database at the college that is open to all current students and alumni. So we have a lot of employers that are contacting our department looking for people to put into their apprenticeship programs. So they often come to the college looking for students that are already taking the classes. So one of the avenues you can use for finding an apprenticeship 
is looking at the Macomb the Macomb Career Link, which is that online jobs database. Employers will post those opportunities on there, and then students can go ahead and apply for those opportunities that way. I also mentioned that Industrial Readiness Certificate Program. That is a program that employers will often, employers who are looking for apprentices will recruit out of. So that is a good credential to follow in order to find an apprenticeship. Other avenues include the United States Department of Labor. If you Google US DOL Apprenticeship Finder, you will go, that will take you to the DOL. That's the United States Department of Labor Office of Apprenticeship. That'll take you to their website. Um, and there's an apprenticeship finder on there where you can search by zip code or by city, um, narrow it down to your geographic region in which you're willing to drive to, to find employers that are hiring, that have apprenticeship programs that are looking for apprentices in your area. Uh, the Michigan Works Talent Connect, if any of you are familiar with that, that's another online jobs database. They also have an avenue that you can filter out and look for employers that are hiring apprentices. Um, so there's a few different ways that you can look through those online systems. Um, you may also find opportunities just driving through industrial areas. A lot of employers now have signs on their buildings that they're hiring apprentices. You could find out about it through word of mouth, particularly if you're taking classes at Macomb. Um, other students and faculty often know about different opportunities that are going on where um, you know, employers are looking to hire apprentices and you can apply for those opportunities. I think the biggest, especially if, um, if you're not familiar with the trades is students who are talking to other students in the classroom. Um, I see that all the time in the classroom that they meet somebody, they may be actively working or just brand new. Right. And, uh, they start talking and then they realize that there's an opening and then next thing you know, they're hired and, you know, they're, they're on their way to an apprenticeship or some companies aren't, you know, there's hired into a different company. They don't have apprenticeship, but um, definitely that seems to be the quickest, um, you know, connection link is student mm -hmm. to student. Okay, great. We've got another one in here. Um, what is the difference between a, a plumber and a pipe fitter? Okay, I can uh, jump in on this one. So uh, there's a lot of confusion about this. Um, Generally, a plumber is going to be working on piping systems that are going to supply uh, water and remove waste from, um, from people, right? So from domestic environments. A pipe fitter is usually installing piping for manufacturing commercial industrial applications. Um, that's why when you look at a plumber, a plumber is licensed in the state of Michigan and a pipe fitter is not. Um, not that one is necessarily more important or the other, but plumbing in itself, the trade has to do with the health and safety of a community. If you think of the old, uh, let's say like gangs in New York, right? Those old movies where people are like buckets of waste that they're just throwing out their window onto the street, right? That's a pretty nasty environment. And that was the world before plumbers. Um, so that's what plumbers do um, opposed to pipe fitters. So pipe fitters are usually more commercial industrial and um, plumbers are dealing with, uh, you know, that domestic water and waste removal. Okay. Uh, we have another one in here. What does a millwright do? So millwrights, there's a couple, there's a um, more of what I would consider to be a maintenance or manufacturing mill right and a construction mill right. The ones that we typically see going through the college are more in the manufacturing and maintenance realm. So mill rights do any number of different tasks in a plant or at an organization, including um, tearing down and building up a line. So typically um, before an assembly line is installed at a plant, it's ran through a supplier that put the tooling together. Um, so typically millwrights will be tasked with erecting that assembly line and then tearing it down and moving and building it back up at the assembly plant where that's going to be um, uh, ran. Um, they could be involved in rigging and moving heavy equipment and machinery around using overhead cranes and hoists and different equipment of that nature. Um, they could also be involved in some different maintenance activities on different machinery. Um, the millwright trade typically requires um, some physical strength. 
Um, so it's typically for, for people that, that like to get out and be very, very active, working with their hands, building things up, tearing things down. Um, construction mill rates, you know, even um, on movie sets, people that uh, put up those platforms and, and build scaffolding, um, those are people that can be considered mill rates as well. Do you want to add anything to that, Tim? You can see mill rates in like uh, really any plant for that matter, wastewater, water purification, mm -hmm. um, you know, the individuals that are going to be setting pumps and setting up, you know, clarifiers and all the shafts and belt bearing alignment, that's all done by mill rates. Okay. Thank yeah, you good very question. much. Good questions. <laughs> um, here's another one. I've heard about stackable credentials. How do they work in skilled trades at Macomb Community College? So there's the Associate of Applied Science degree. Um, and that you can stack a couple of different certificates. So start with, say, let's say, um, let's use welding as an example. So you can start with just the basic welding certificate. Let's say you're really digging that and you would want to advance on. We have an advanced welding certificate. So you then stack that advanced welding certificate onto the basic. Let's say then that you wanted to go ahead and get that Associate of Applied Science credential. You could then stack in those 15 credits of general education courses and round that out with possibly some related electives to get to the 62 credits. The college still offers what's called the Associate of General Studies degree as well. And so that would allow you to stack probably three certificates. So the Associate of General Studies is 62 credits in, in any courses at the college. Um, so you can stack multiple certificates together and then get an Associate of General Studies out of that deal. Um, and then I would even go so far as to say stacking uh, those certificates, you know, stacking into an Associate of Applied Science degree, you then stack that whole thing into a bachelor's degree. So, you know, that is a pathway of stackable credentials for you right there. Other, there might be some smaller industry certifications embedded into some certificates, which can also be considered a form of a stackable credential. A robotic certificate is a good example of that. So the robotic certificate consists of some robotics and electronics classes. And then through some of those robotics classes, by completing those individual classes, students also get what's called an industry certification by completing that class. So our robotics classes are, are ran through a company called FANUC, um, or I'm sorry, accredited by a company called FANUC. So when the student completed completes those courses, they also get that little mini industry credential on their way to earning the robotics certificate, which you could then stack into an electronic certificate and just keep stacking those skill sets. All right. Um... Tim, do you have anything to add tonight? We're going to be uh, just doing our conclusion real quick, but I want to thank you both for being here tonight. It was a wealth of information, and um, we're going to be posting um, Vicki Gordon and um, Tim Palowski's uh, information, so if you have any further questions, please reach out to them. Um, so thanks again, guys, for being here. Before we jump to the next slide, I did want to mention there was a couple questions that were asked in the general chat, um, and they, they were answered in there too, but I just wanted to point them out because they were pretty good questions. Um, it was the difference between credit hours and contact hours, um, and it's answered in there. Credit hours are how universities and colleges define if you are considered full-time or part-time in college. Contact hours are the amount of time you spend in class or if it's virtual how much time you spend on the course. So it's pretty much how much time you're in that class during the week. Um, and then where can I go to look for or find current scholarship opportunities? And that was also listed on there. We offer private scholarships at Macomb. So we have two links in there. One link will take you to the scholarship page at macomb.edu. And then another link will take you directly to our Oasis, um, our Oasis page, which is how you can search for scholarships. And once you're an admitted student, you can actually create an account on Oasis that will help you find scholarships that are um, directly suited for you. All right, great. Thank you, Sarah, for uh, pointing that out. We appreciate it. Um, I want to touch on the, the credit hour, contact hour. So many of our classes, let's say you say a, a traditional two credit hour class, right? It's going to be assumed you're going to meet for two hours. And a lot of those are usually lecture-based courses. Uh, I always kind of refer to credit hours as being um, like lecture hours, even though that's not how McComb says it, but that's kind of how it equates. When you get into some of our hands-on courses, um, we need to provide content to the students through lectures, but 
Then there's that hands-on portion. And, and because of just the time it takes to leave the classroom, enter the lab, get the equipment set up, start working on a part, um, you need time, right? So sometimes in applied tech, you'll see classes where um, they have a, um, a mismatch of credit hours and actual meeting hours, right? Those contact hours. So you could have a three credit hour course, but you're going to meet for four hours, right? Or a two credit hour course, you're going to meet for three hours. Um, so what contact hours are referring to, referring to is the actual time that you're going to be spending um, in that classroom. It's going to be a combination of lecture and or lab potentially, um, but it gives the students a better idea of what they're signing up for because some students were maybe caught off guard. They'd sign up for a class um, and not realize that it was going to meet longer, um, even though that's all displayed on the website. Um, and then it also covered the cost, right, of, of operating for that amount of time on the school side. So, And we just want to thank everybody for being here tonight for our Discover Macomb. Um, watch your email for some information um, about applying. And we will be uh, following up with more information um, at the beginning of your journey at Macomb. We do want to let you know that um, there will be a drawing for a $50 bookstore gift certificate, uh, and it'll be awarded after each Discover Macomb uh, event. So check your email. It'll be held tomorrow. We also, for every event that you attend of Discover Macomb, uh, you will re receive one entry into the scholarship drawing, and that'll be held on March 7th. So the winner will also be notified by email. Um, make sure that you check the uh, website, use the QR code, the registration link is below. We do have a couple of other um, upcoming Discover Macomb events, so please join us for those. So again, we want to thank everybody for attending. Um, if there are further questions or you think of anything tomorrow, please feel free to reach out to us and everyone have a great night. Thanks everyone for being here.